give a special thanks to uh, to Ben, who I know is not here right now, uh, but uh, for the very, very kind invitation um, for me to come and uh, talk. It's a great pleasure to be here. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Food Rev, and, uh, which is a wonderful nonprofit in San Francisco that uh, I am uh, involved in uh, as uh, an AI advisor. And I'm going to talk about um, uh, all the cool, interesting work that uh, I'm doing there and hopefully will be entertaining. So about myself. So uh, my background is in computer science and artificial intelligence. So uh, for a little while, I was a lecturer at USC in computer science. And um, while there, I did a bunch of work in uh, applied AI research, sort of stuff in, uh, in the area of security, uh, a lot of stuff in virtual environments and so-called serious games, sort of virtual environments to help train people to do stuff. Um, and then I worked at a series of startups. And then eventually I found my way up here to the Bay Area uh, where I work at uh, AT&T in Palo Alto. And one of the first things that I did uh, upon arriving there is uh, I created this uh, course along with my colleague there, a data science course uh, for Udacity. Uh, what AT&T got out of it is they wanted coursework uh, to help train people to become data scientists within the company. And Udacity got a data science class uh, for its uh, then emerging uh, data science nano degree program. So uh, today at the Foundry, so it's this place called the AT&T Foundry, it's an innovation center. Uh, and there's lots of different people who do different kinds of things there. Uh, but for myself and the people that I work with, uh, we build intelligent systems uh, to help different parts of AT&T change how they operate. So AT&T is in this world, like many other companies, of uh, dramatically increasing scale and complexity. And lots of people who have been responsible for doing something manually for 25, 30 years are now essentially in a, in a state where they can no longer do this. Uh, basically, they're problems which just no longer fit in people's brains. And so me and the people that I work with, we create intelligent systems to help them manage this complexity. Uh, and hopefully along the way, bring radical change to how AT&T works. So today I want to do a couple of things. So I talked about intelligent systems. And before I talk about uh, the particular type of intelligent system that uh, uh, we are working on at FoodRev, uh, I want to talk about what this means, intelligent systems. And what does it mean uh, for a piece of software to use AI? And how is that different from just a regular old software engineering project? Okay, intelligent systems. So let's suppose I got a bunch of numbers and they're unsorted and I want to put them into sorted order. And I want to construct some box where I give these numbers to this box and it spits them out in sorted order. Would it be reasonable to call this box an intelligent system? So intuitively, we would all like to say, no, it's not an intelligent system, right? Because many of us are very familiar with computer science. And if you study computer science, you know that there are these algorithms like quick sort, like bucket sort that have provably optimal qualities where they will put the numbers in the proper sorted order if, uh, and if they're comparative based sort and uh, uh, various provably optimal qualities. And we have an optimal solution. And if you are, have a problem or a bunch of people care about this problem, and people have produced provably optimal solutions, you should use the provably optimal solution. But let's suppose that we are in a case where we don't know anything about sorting numbers. So we don't have any of this knowledge. We just have these numbers, but what we do know uh, is we know how to swap two numbers. We pick two numbers, we can swap their positions, and we can recognize the solution when someone has shown it to us. So I know how to recognize when the numbers are in sorted order. What can I do with just that? So I might choose two numbers and randomly switch them. And from each of those hypothetical possible futures, I might propose more numbers to switch until eventually I arrive at the numbers in proper sorted order. And then if I follow these nodes from the leaf to the root, you will eventually arrive at a sequence of steps that put the numbers in sorted order. And this list of steps is just as optimal as something that might come out of quicksort or some other sorting algorithm. And I was able to produce this knowledge not knowing anything about sorting, I didn't have to read any papers, I didn't have to read any textbooks. But like, you know, who cares? Like I could have solved this problem by just spending an afternoon reading about sorting algorithms and then arrived at the optimal solution. I could have just done that, who cares about this? Well, the reason that this is interesting is the very same algorithm applies to 
totally different problems. So things like theorem proving. So this is uh, a page from chapter two of Principia Mathematica by Russell and Whitehead. And it turns out that a theorem proving system using essentially the very same algorithm, very, very minor changes, um, arrived at proofs for all of the theorems in chapter two. And in some cases produced proofs that were shorter than are in the book. The very same algorithm, again, with very minor changes, uh, also does things like military logistics planning. So in this problem, essentially what you have is you have two military bases, uh, base A and base B. You have a bunch of stuff in base A, and you just want to move it to base B. And what happened is, back in the day, people would sit around and think for months. How do I come up with a list of steps that are like tens of thousands of steps long uh, that moves all of the stuff from place A to place B? So things like, um, this truck has to be ready here. These people have to be uh, uh, in proper position at the right time. They have to take this crate of oranges and put it over here. They have to go over to this boat. They have to do this. It's this massive nightmare uh, log logistical problem that people manually spent months solving. So they engaged researchers uh, to create planning systems to solve this problem for them. Uh, and now they solve exactly the same problem in hours. And in fact, so much money was spent, um, was saved uh, in man hours from this problem that the military announced that um, the amount of money that was saved was more than they had announced, that they had um, uh, awarded to all of AI research in the previous 30 years combined. So they were sold on AI. Okay, so here's the big idea. Quicksort has many provable optimal qualities and is super awesome, but it only sorts numbers. Uh, this very simple algorithm, which I'm sure many of you recognize as a guided search, solves a very large list of problems, including sorting numbers. And this sort of gets to this idea of what is it about AI that people are trying to accomplish? We want sort of a general, the thing about human beings that we're trying to replicate is we're like general reasoning tools. You can throw a human being at all sorts of kinds of problems and you can figure, you can figure them out using sort of the tools that I have on me. So, uh, as I mentioned before, sorting num numbers is interesting, but I kind of solved it just by reading. Where this becomes really interesting is in problems like this. I'm sure many of you will uh, know where this is from. This is uh, Lee Sedol, then the uh, number one ranked player in Go, losing to DeepMind's AlphaGo. So, uh, as you may know, Go is a game which is many thousands of years old. And uh, there has been a standing challenge to create a piece of software that will beat a professionally ranked player at Go. Uh, and there's serious prize money, it was a million dollars uh, that had gone uh, unawarded for many decades uh, up until this year. And it was won by DeepMind. Uh, and the thing is that you know, people know how to play Go. There are people such as Lisa Dahl who knows how to play the game of Go and like better than basically any, any other human being on the face of the earth. But the thing is, is in order to arrive at this knowledge, it requires a lifetime of dedication. And the people who made AlphaGo, they are not Go masters. They know a little bit about Go, but they knew just enough essentially to describe the game to a software system. And then that system, using these sort of lower level reasoning algorithms, arrived at this knowledge of how to play Go as good or better than uh, current human, any human player. And the thing is, is that the strategies which the system produced uh, are novel and in fact are uh, strategies which haven't been seen in the thousands of years that the game has been played. And actually the, um, the strategies that it has, been, it has produced have since been used by other Go players against other humans. So it's like an, an alien arrived on Earth and sort of learned to play again. So where this becomes really interesting, hello, there we go, is in solving problems, that nobody knows where the solution is. So if I were to give you uh, a picture with a face on it, everyone in this room would immediately be able to say, yes, this contains a face or it does not contain a face. However, if I were to ask you to write down an unambiguous step-by-step -step procedure that says, if you do this, followed by this, followed by this, followed by this, unambiguously, you will determine that this is a face, this is not a face. So this is basically knowledge that everyone has access to intuitively at a totally subconscious level. No one, you can't tell someone how to recognize a face. However, the sort of triumph of machine learning is such that if I simply give it many examples of this is a face, this is not a face, it is able to extract precisely this algorithm that I'm looking for, where here is the set of steps. If you perform this set of steps, I can tell you that this is a face or this is not a face, uh, which is kind of like miraculous if you think about it. It's uh, one of many examples 
of uh, a computer program revealing knowledge to us. So here's the idea. The way to think about intelligent systems, in my opinion, is general problem solving tools. There's some problem that you wish to solve. And if you know how to solve it, you can write down a program that simply executes the steps of your solution. However, if you don't know how to solve the problem, intelligent systems can really be brought to bear. All you need to do is describe the problem statement, and then the intelligent system can describe the solution to the problem to you. And that's why it is useful. However, if you have a problem that a lot of people care about and have studied as domain expert, often you'll have an optimal solution. And if that's true, you should use the optimal solution. So if someone says to you, hey, I've got this great idea for a startup, we're going to use AI to solve all pairs shortest paths. You'd be like, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. Someone has solved that problem. Let's use Dijkstra's algorithm or whatever. Okay, so in order to do these things, intelligent systems typically employ two things that human beings basically take for granted. So one, is the ability to represent knowledge in the world. Uh, so people used to accomplish this uh, via symbolic logic-based systems, but these are essentially uh, brittle and aren't really expressive enough to, expressive enough to capture uh, most realistic situations. The second thing that they require is the ability to reason about long-term goals. So it's not enough simply to understand things about the world. Sometimes I want to do stuff. I have some agenda that I wish to accomplish. And how do I put actions together in order to get myself closer to my agenda, given sometimes that the outcomes of actions are sometimes uncertain and my goal may be vaguely defined. So intelligent systems typically put these two things together and sometimes get miraculous things. So I want to talk about, uh, in some technical detail, uh, about a particular intelligent system uh, that I uh, am fortunate enough to be involved with. So food rev. So food rev is a nonprofit organization in San Francisco uh, that is focused on uh, feeding those who are hungry. So there are lots and lots of uh, hungry people uh, in the United States. And uh, the people who created Food Rev, one of which is uh, in the audience tonight, um, were interested in this problem of feeding those who are hungry. And at first, uh, the founders thought about, well, maybe we should investigate cheaper ways of producing food. But then they discovered the following scary statistic, which is that 40% of food which is produced in the United States is thrown away. And simultaneously, somehow, there are almost 50 million people who live in food insecure households. So what does this mean, food insecure? So this means that at least one meal per week, you don't know where it's coming from. You just sort of hope that it's going to appear. And so it seems strange, like this total paradox, that if we could simply solve this like logistical problem, just this, if we could distribute food so much more intelligently, we should be able to address part of this problem. And so food rev is about, is about that problem. The idea is to take pools of volunteer drivers, ask them to go to places that wish to donate excess food, and send them to places who are in need. So the places who are, these are places that many of you heard, have heard of, large chain, um, uh, restaurants, cafes, uh, that the food is perfectly good, they simply can't keep it at the end of the day because people will not accept it the following day. So they throw it away. Uh, and then the people who are receiving food are people such as uh, food banks, low-income housing, or uh, individual units. So let's think about what this, let's think about bringing in some formalization to this problem. So you have a bunch of people who have food they wish to donate, food donators. Uh, each donator is at some location and has some amount of supply, some number of meals that they have available to, uh, to donate. You have a bunch of people who have said that they wish to receive food donations. Each one of them is also at some location and has some outstanding demand that they wish to be met. And you also managed to collect a pool of volunteer drivers. Each one of them have a car, hopefully. Uh, and each car has some amount of capacity. And so what uh, the human being called the coordinator presently does manually is the following task. They want to find an assignment of drivers to trips. So essentially they will go to a donator, pick up food, and drive it to a place that is in need. And you want to find a complete assignment 
such that all of the food is delivered within four hours and the overall number of trips is minimized. Uh, and once you've decided what the steps are of this plan, we'll transmit the steps uh, via text messaging and phone calls. So it sounds simple, simple enough. So let's think about why is this hard? So the parameters of the problem, so things like how many drivers will be available? How many people will be donating food? Where are those people located? All of these things, it turns out, are constantly in flux right up until the moment of the event. So you think you have maybe the night before uh, 10, 15 people who will be available to drive, but then the evening of you discover that you have only five, but you don't know which five. Uh, also, some people say, uh, yes, I have food that I am, uh, I am willing to donate. Uh, and they tell you that uh, they have a location where you can go to pick up food, but then you go there and you discover that the location is closed and they actually meant to send you to a different location. So now you have to go to a totally different place. So all of these things are constantly in flux and you must sort of be on your feet and think about new plans. And the instructions that you gave to people like 30 minutes ago, now you need to figure out who, uh, who you said what to and send them appropriate new instructions. Uh, in addition, sometimes deliveries are they take more effort than you think they would. Maybe you get there and discover that this is a two-person job, and now you need to assign a second person that you thought was going to be free for some other delivery. Uh, and then meanwhile, all these people are text messaging you, asking where should they go, what should they be doing. So it doesn't take a lot of, uh, it's pretty easy to see how the problem doesn't have to get to too big of a size before it starts to become overwhelming. and becomes very, very hard to fit into your mind. And so this leads to quick burnout. Uh, so food rub is not, uh, yes, sir. Uh, so I can't, I can't, uh, divulge specific numbers, but think on the order of like, so sort of like, uh, for human beings manually solving the problem, the order is sort of on the order of tens for each, for each item. Um, and so, um, so this leads to quick burnout. So FoodRev is not the first organization to do such a thing, but what happens typically is these, place, these uh, types of operations appear, they do this job for a while, and then they kind of burn out, and then they don't do it anymore. Uh, and in fact, FoodRev has had uh, more than one coordinator who uh, enlisted themselves to perform this job, and then after a week or so, we're like, I can't do this, I can't do this anymore. Uh, and so this problem was really why I was allowed to contribute to do something. So if I was just some dude off the street and I just sort of said, hey, let me help you, it'd be like, we're good. Why don't you go leave us alone? So it's really, okay, so funny anecdote. Uh, I had the very good fortune uh, to meet uh, Peter Norvig. So I'm sure many of you know, Peter Norvig is the director of research at Google. Um, and I was describing this problem to him. And he said, how on earth did you get them to let you help them? And I said, well, what happened is they sort of have this problem that they're manually trying to solve and like it's sort of really become overwhelming. Um, and so I said that, hey, we can apply intelligent systems in order to sort of alleviate some of the problem of sort of being overwhelmed by cognitive load. I'm like, I'm sure that you, Peter Norvig, and your wide experience have had similar situations. He's like, oh yeah, when I was working on the Mars rovers at NASA, we faced a very similar situation. And I'm like, thank you for telling me what's what, Peter Norvig. <laughs> Uh, so super nice dude, like one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life. He was telling me the story about how um, when they were, uh, he, he and his team went to the people who were making the planning systems for the Mars rovers. and like, hey, I can help you make control systems for the Mars rovers. And they're like, no, 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 what we're doing is too important for your funny business. We're just going to author manually all of these plans. And uh, as some of you may know, the Mars rovers were designed to run for um, 90 days. They ended up running for five years. And what happened is after 90 days, uh, they started to freak out. And they're like, hey, Peter Norberg, can you please help us? We're really tired of doing this and we don't know how to do it anymore. He's like, yeah, sure, we'll help you. Okay, so I was like, at first, okay, my first response was like, okay, no problem. People solved this problem in the 70s. We'll take care of it. No reason human beings need to be taking care of this problem. So if you want to formulate this as a planning problem, what do you need? You need a couple of things. You need to say, okay, here's my initial state of the world. Here are the set of things I can do, and I need a way to recognize when I've achieved my goal. So it turns out that this domain can be described by four actions. Uh, a person gets in a car and drives from location A to location B. 
a person is assigned to a car, um, a car will uh, load itself with meals at some location, and that, or unload itself at, at some location. And if you want to put together a plan, it sort of looks like collections of these steps. And for a real problem, uh, it's typically on the order of many hundreds of steps long. And so feeling very pleased with myself, I'm like, here we are. I have solved the problem. Behold. Uh, and I discovered what the first problem was. It's discovered how wrong I was. So first problem, small problem. So recall I described there was this business of uh, people who say, hey, I wish to receive food. They receive it. Uh, and they register themselves as saying, hey, here's my outstanding demand. But what happens is no one tells you what their demand is. What happens instead is some number of people will say, here's the maximum amount of food I'm able to, to take. But the other places don't say anything. It's basically up to you how much you want to take to them. So it's an underspecified problem. You must decide how much you take to which place. Let's suppose that you solve that problem. There's a much larger second problem, which is your planner produces a bunch of plans. Each of these plans fulfills the outstanding demand. But the thing is, is that they're not equally good. If you take two such plans and you present them to um, the human coordinator who has experience solving this problem, they will prefer one to the other. And what's worse is they can't tell you why. It's totally subjective. It's just simply a product of their intuition, their experience, their judgment. They're like, I know that this plan is better than this other one. I can't really express one. If I could somehow have that intuition, okay, so in order to understand an example of that, or in order to understand that, let me, let me describe an example. So consider two plans. The first plan, here's a set of steps that gets the food from the people who wish to donate to the people who wish to receive it. All of the demand, all the outstanding demand is met. And all of the volunteer drivers, the number of trips is evenly distributed amongst all of the drivers. So, so totally equitable. Okay, plan number two. Again, all of the demand is met. It's slightly more uneven. So some of the drivers get more of the trip burden than others. However, as a result of doing that, when people finish at the end of the night, they're very close to their home location. So the sort of dislocation they experience from their home, the amount, the, so the amount of time that they have to spend driving from their last stop in the evening to going back home is minimized to a much greater degree. So which one of these is better? I don't know. However, if you present these to um, certain coordinators, they will prefer one over, over the other, um, simply because maybe they know the people who are driving that night and they know intuitively how important it is to people to end up closer to their home on one night versus another. So if you had this sort of intuition about what makes one plan better than another plan in the form of a score, you could simply put this in as uh, something to optimize for, and you would have what amounts to a multi-criteria optimization problem, a number of steps in the score. Uh, but what we have instead is a multi-criteria optimization problem in which one of the criteria is a totally subjective value. So the worst of all worlds. So what should we do? So if we think about this problem, you have your planner. It produces a bunch of plans. All of them fulfill the outstanding demand, but they're all different somehow. I could select a plan and I could solicit a score from the human operator or from the, uh, the coordinator. And say, I would say, hey, human operator or coordinator, um, how good is this plan? And maybe I get a number out the other end. And this number might conform to some distribution. So there's some stochasticity in this, uh, for example, because maybe if you show uh, the same plan to the same coordinator on one night versus another night, they may give you a slightly different answer. Or if you give it to a different coordinator, they may give you a slightly different answer. So there's some sort of stochasticity to this. So I'm sure some of you are looking at this and are thinking, man, that looks a whole lot like a, a multi-armed bandit problem. And you are correct. So multi-armed bandit problem. What this is, is let's suppose you are confronted with a whole bunch of options. Uh, let's call them A1 through AN. A for option. Um, and the idea is if you choose one, you get a number at the other end. Let's call it a, a row, sometimes referred to as a reward. Uh, and this number uh, arrives according to a distribution, which is a function of the option that you chose. And what are we trying to do? So the, state, the problem statement is, uh, if you're confronted with these options over and over again, 
you want to find which action should I choose such that in the long term, the expected value of the award that I get is maximized. So it's called a multi, so for those of you who may not be familiar, a multi-armed bandit uh, uh, receives this name uh, by a, a, via analogy uh, with slot machines. So a slot machine is called a one-armed bandit. A bank of slot machines is a multi-armed bandit. So each one of these machines, yes, sir. So, so just thinking about this, uh, the, the simplest version of this problem statement, I want to maximize the, uh, the expected reward of, uh, of uh, uh, let, me, let me continue with the statement, and we can uh, continue that discussion. So, uh, so with a, uh, a bank of slot machines, the idea is you want to find which machine is essentially giving me the best payoff. Which one should I continue pulling the, the lever on? And so in order to, uh, oh, and sort of this gets to this idea of supervised learning versus reinforcement learning. So supervised learning, you have labeled data. Uh, and essentially, you make a guess, and you are informed what the correct answer was supposed to be. With reinforcement learning, you don't get this. What you have instead is, here's how good your guess was. You get a score that says, here's how good your guess was. But the thing is, there might be a better guess out there. So you don't, you don't know what sort of the, the, the maximum score that is available is out there. And so that, that entails this problem that you have to spend some of your time just sort of trying different stuff out there uh, and exploring other options uh, in order to determine um, uh, if there's a better option out there. But if you spend all of your time just exploring, uh, you're not collecting a lot of reward because you've found something that already gives a lot of high reward. Uh, in your initial exploration phase. And so there is this trade-off between exploration and exploitation. And that's sort of one of these um, uh, uh, signature elements of reinforcement learning. So here's the thing that we're trying to do, is we're trying to figure out uh, what is the action uh, that has the best expected total reward. And so let's represent this quantity with uh, a Q of A. And so one way to think about maintaining this number is every time I hit the action or the, uh, the option A, I'm going to get this number out the other end, and I'll just directly measure this, this average number. I'll just take all the, I'll sum these values and I'll divide it by the total number of times that I've selected that option. And so let's apply this back to our problem. So my planner is producing a bunch of plans, and I don't know how good each one is. I want to find the one that sort of gives me the best long-term reward. But the thing is, is that there's like a million different kinds of plans, and you're basically never going to see the same plan twice, so you want to transform it into this space that is more general somehow. So instead of just the plan P, let's consider features of the plan. So we want to resolve it into these, um, these four features. And just the description of this, uh, these features that, um, that I chose are uh, the total number of trips in the plan, the trip evenness, which essentially is an entropy measure, um, so how are the number of trips distributed amongst the volunteer drivers? Uh, the driver dislocation, so this is this concept of uh, how far away are they when they end up at the end of the night from their initial location? Uh, and then the evenness of those differences. And so instead of just looking at the plans and mapping them to an expected reward that we're trying to estimate, let's map them uh, from this tuple of features to that, to that number. And so we're trying to estimate the expected value of choosing this transformed tuple. And so how do we do this? So if we think about the entire process, there's an incoming request that says, okay, I have this partially specified problem. Here's sort of an evening um, uh, in which I want to uh, find a total plan, the best plan to transport food uh, to fulfill outstanding demand. The planner takes this request does some churning, produces a, uh, a sampling of, of possible plans. Using its current estimate of Q, it resolves these into this more generalized feature space, and then says, okay, here's my current uh, estimate as to how good each of these plans are, and it chooses a, sum, a small number of them. We send those plans to the coordinator, the human coordinator, and then the coordinator chooses one using their intuition, using their experience, using their knowledge. 
the one that they choose, that's the one that gets the positive signal. And so over time, this function estimator Q comes to capture essentially this knowledge of what sets apart one plan from another, which is precisely what we're looking for. So what does this get us? So currently, the problem is severely bound essentially by the human cognitive load of the human of the coordinator. So basically, the problem can only scale to a certain size. Uh, the the uh, as a, uh, the problem as the um, uh, food rev becomes more popular, more people want to donate food, more people uh, want to uh, be receivers of food, more people want to volunteer as drivers. But if it's just a human being who's doing coordination, it can only grow to a certain size before it starts to become overwhelming. So with the inclusion of this system, our hope is that we can remove this upper bound. So basically, as many people who want to, who want to be drivers, as many people who want to donate food, as many people who want to be receivers of this food, we can handle all of it, so long as we have enough hardware to run our system. And we do this by first removing this communication overhead. But in addition, using an intelligent system to help the coordinator arrive at the best plan for a situation. Uh, and importantly, the coordinator is still involved. So it's not 100% automated. They're not removed from the loop. There is a, a place for the coordinator to insert their knowledge, their experience, their expertise. Uh, and so that's all I had to share. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Yes, sir. Do you actually use like a classical AI planner to solve this problem, or do you use like this immediately jump stack to start making this software that we put in your program? Uh, what do you use the actual planning in this problem? Yeah, so it turns out that um, uh, every so a planning problem can be cast as an integer programming problem. Uh, so it's sort of that's sort of just a question of like how do you want to express the problem? Um, it's sort of like so. And so if the problem was fully specified and you knew exactly what the uh, criteria that you were trying to optimize for, uh, you could just do that. Uh, but that's what makes it interesting and hard is one, um, uh, it's an underspecified problem and two, you don't know what the criteria are. And that's sort of why you have to sort of go to this business of sort of soliciting this information from a coordinator. I, I like, but those like that class of problems with the, It's interesting, it's like, I mean, if there's this task of like, you want to, you cannot scale intuition. Essentially, you just need more human beings to do it. And so how, so this is, there's this, so this is essentially a, some sort of desperate way to like scale the human's intuition. Sort of what, can we come up with a model that sort of does this function approximation sufficiently well enough? So, yeah, so that's a super good question. So right now we're in the stage where we're sort of babysitting the, um, that learner, we're trying to bootstrap it with sufficient data samples. Uh, so we don't really have enough yet um, to make it be a production system. Um, so I guess I can't give you a full answer to that question yet. But we feel pretty good about it. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. That's correct, yeah, for sure. I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, sorry, do you have a course in four things that makes it that the problem is like not happening Yeah, absolutely, you're correct. Yeah, yeah. So one approach, so, okay. So that basically, that, so that applies to essentially every kind of feature representation. You've described the feature representation problem, essentially. Uh, and so what can we do to, do to address that? So, uh, so what people did sort of prior to the era of deep learning is you just sort of talk to domain experts and you're like, what should I be paying attention to? What sort of has something to do with this problem? 
but our hope is that in the long term, when we, um, especially when we've scaled this to, to uh, lots and lots and lots more problems, that we could use deep learning approaches to sort of arrive at which features tend to be more important. Just funding, I'm sorry? Um, Oh, I see your thing. So I see. So the so the question is, uh, is the goal just to find the best arm, or is the or is the goal to um, to just maximize reward over time? Well, I suppose one of the uh, one of the premises of sort of the multi-armed abandon problem is that sort of that's what constitutes the best arm, uh, but. Uh, you could phrase the problem in a lot of ways. So one way to phrase it, so, so the best way to phrase it, so sort of like the most precise way to phrase the problem is like, all right, I want to find the best arm, the sequence of arms that in the long run gives me the best expected return. Uh, however, you can make it a less precise version of the problem uh, if maybe the, uh, which may be required due to various reasons by saying things like, okay, there's a bad, so if you look at, um, your feature space, so imagine this sort of like four dimensional feature space, which I described. Um, uh, there are some parts of it which you may discover are just bad. They're like disaster regions and non-disaster regions. And you could simply say like, all right, I'm not gonna care about this problem of maximizing long-term reward. I just want to be not in the disaster region. So when I come up with a plan, I'll, I, it'll give me, it equips me with the knowledge of which plan should I reject in favor of some other plan. or Better yet, if you get a plan, how should I adjust this plan such that I, I move it closer to the non-disaster region? Uh, so there are multiple ways in which you might sort of phrase that as a, uh, as a problem. Uh, okay, thank you guys very much. Feel free to hang out, grab a beer, drink, talk.